I greet you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Welcome to church today. How wonderful to see you all. A special welcome to our brothers and sisters from Assam, Nagaland, Mizoram, Maharashtra. Did I miss out any? <laughs> yes. And uh, what a pleasure it is to have you worship with us. And uh, uh, thank you so much for taking the time and, of course, leading us also in worship. Uh, as was uh, I perhaps mentioned that uh, last week, was it? Yes, last week was a busy week. Was it uh, the week before? I think last week, Manoj, you were in uh, Pune. The week before that, I was in uh, Pune and Mumbai. And of course, before that, we went to Vijaywada. And we were able to uh, spend a very enjoyable day of fellowship with uh, Balswami and uh, Swarna. And of course, uh, Nikki was there and Mr. Rao was there. It was uh, a time of uh, tremendous uh, joy for us to just uh, be able to sit in their home, enjoy the meals they prepared. And uh, of course, we spent some time in prayer and uh, discussion. So uh, after that, of course, uh, the following day, I had to go to Pune, where I spent some time with uh, Sachin and Shanti, uh, and also met the pastors, where they have been uh, uh, fellowshipping. Uh, interesting thoughts and questions that we had, and uh, so uh, we uh, were able to spend some quality time. We are hoping that those discussions will move forward, and maybe we can have some kind of partnership. By the way, are we having by uh, Sunday school? Did you want us to pray for the children before they go? Okay. Why don't the Sunday school children come forward then? Are you going now? Okay. So they already went. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, and then, of course, uh, Sachin uh, uh, and I drove all the way from Pune to Mumbai uh, and visited with uh, two families, Dr. Sudhir Singh and his wife, Sheba. I think you've seen pictures of them. And uh, uh, and then we, we visited uh, Elizabeth. These these uh, these uh, members are all in their seventies and eighties. They are what we call as shut-ins because they can't travel now. Uh, they have fellowshiped with us for so many years. We uh, were so happy to meet with them, talk to them, provide them pastoral care, prayed with them listened to them, and uh, so it was a full day of uh, driving and meeting, and uh, we were fairly tired when we came back. We found some hotel, Sachin booked a hotel for us and uh, crashed for the night. Next day, we had worship with the Mumbai Brethren. Of course, we have a small fellowship group there, and, uh, and then, of course, we returned in the evening. So that was uh, uh, a very helpful visit. I have been visiting uh, for a, uh, haven't visited there for a long time. Uh, uh, I forgot um, Jessica's friend uh, you're from also oh you're from Chennai pardon me for not mentioning Chennai right uh, but you're also so I know we are very happy that you can join us okay um, <clears throat> Tom Holland is a British historian uh, author to many best-selling books. There is one spe specifically called Dominion. And I don't know if you heard of his name, but he has written some very interesting books and done research on the influence of Christianity uh, in the world, especially Western civilization. Uh, and in a recent interview, as he was discussing and talking about uh, Christianity, and what it teaches, what it believes. He made a very strange comment, which uh, perked my ears. And uh, he was telling the interviewer, you know, Christianity, or rather, uh, pastors and church leaders must preach the weirdness of Christianity. The word weirdness seemed a little jarring, but... He seemed to indicate there are some awkward, you know, teachings of Christianity. In other words, he's saying we should not compromise on these strange teachings of 
the Christian faith, right? And we know from the scriptures that indeed some of our beliefs are or would strike people as very strange. Even in that time when the Apostle Paul was preaching, he himself said, the preachings of Christianity is a stumbling block for the Jews because of its strangeness. And it is foolishness to the Greek because the Greeks believe in intellectualism uh, and they found it so hard to accept the teachings of the Christian faith. And indeed, if you look at the scriptures, isn't it strange? The teachings of Christianity indeed is strange. Let me just highlight a few. Jesus says, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, what must you do? Give him another hit on his jaw so that you take out two of his teeth. Jesus says, turn to him the other also. I mean, isn't this weird? Certainly something that is so hard for us to accept. Look at another one. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now you know what's coming next, right? But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I mean, even Jesus finds it a bit, I mean, the way he's putting it across is, it's strange. He said, you have heard that we must hate our enemies. But then he goes on to say we should love our enemies. Peter also brings out the strangeness of the Christian teaching. He says, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Now, can we be in a position to bless someone who is insulting us? Very hard, very hard. Indeed, very weird. And of course, maybe two more. Many who are first will be last. I mean, is that what the world teaches? He says, we got to be first. But Jesus is saying, if you are last, you are first. Very weird, isn't it? And of course, for us leaders, so hard to accept. We are told, or Jesus tells us, if you're going to be a leader, be a servant. Oh, no. <laughs> servant? I want somebody to carry my briefcase. I want somebody to give me the big throne so that I can sit on it. Right? Like in some churches they do. <laughs> but it is said. Anyway, Palm Sunday, the day we commemorate today, is one of those events that brings out the weirdness, the strangeness, the awkward teachings of the Christian faith into sharp focus. And I want to highlight one, even as we were read in the scripture. Uh, and I want to pick up that and then tie it up with the second reading in the book of Romans, where it talks about being we being more than conquerors. And once we've heard that, and I'm sure that will be a tremendous challenge for us, a big challenge, which indeed will even more and more highlight our need for a savior. Let's pick up the story in the book of Luke chapter 19, the gospel of Luke chapter 19, the story of Palm Sunday, and I'll read just one or two verses in verse 30, it says, go into that village over there. And he told them, as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there. And no one has ever ridden. I specifically chose these words because I wanted to highlight this donkey business. You know, it is nicely sanitized as colt, you know, in the reading. But <laughs> it was a donkey yeah, that he was, uh, was talking about. Untie it, bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying just say the Lord needs it. You know, actually, when the people heard that, they were happy. They thought, at last, this so-called Messiah is taking some action. He's coming into Jerusalem. He is probably going to storm into Jerusalem. 
and finally overthrow the Roman government and restore the nation of Israel. Remember, that was the prophecy, right? That was what they were all looking for. The, the, the Jews, the, the, the remnant of the Israelites, they were looking forward to that because they were, you know, suffering under the rule of the Romans. So they finally thought he is going to ride into Jerusalem and establish the kingdom because that was what was prophesied. But then Jesus rides on a donkey? I mean, what kind of an entry is this? Right? Uh, very odd. Very weird, like we said earlier. Uh, conquering king, what does he ride on? At least a horse. I mean, it, if not one horse, two horses with a chariot, with an army with Victoria, the victorious army behind him, right? Uh, Jesus on a donkey, no army, no swords, no guns, no bombs. Of course, there were no gun, guns and bombs at that time. But what about conquering, you know, Jerusalem and restoring the kingdom? But nevertheless, the people were happy. At least this person who was supposedly the Messiah, is doing something, is going into Jerusalem, right? Hoping against hope, people are happy. And in verse 37, it says, as he was drawing near, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice, praising God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And you remember they waved these branches they put them on the streets and, of course, their courts. If not, if it was not a horse, at least a, let the donkey ride on it, you know. L we are hoping now that he'll conquer and uh, bring uh, victory. And this, as Praveen explained, Pastor Praveen explained, this is the sign of triumph and victory. And so... Uh, Jesus rides into Jerusalem and the people were waiting to see what he's going to do. But we know as the events unfolded, as the various things began to take place and the Holy Week, as we have come to call it, begins to uh, unfold before their eyes, disappointment sets in. What happened to the conquering king? Why is he behaving so weak? What has happened to this prophesied Messiah who was to restore the kingdom? And we can have the kingdom at last. And even worse, when they saw him being lifted up on the cross, uh, they were so, so disappointed and dejected that many of them abandoned him. Even his close disciples were now afraid that they, Roman, uh, the Roman and the religious leaders will come after them. What happened? Why is this king behaving so weak? Doesn't he know the Romans are going to kill him? Why has he given himself to the Roman soldiers? You see, in answer to that disappointment, Jesus says something very startling. Perhaps we can use again the word that Tom Holland uses, weird. He says in verse 41, reading in the same narrative, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. Is that a sign of weakness? Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. And then he says something very interesting and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. If you had known, only known, what would bring you peace? But now it is hidden from your eyes. That's uh, something I just want to dwell on for a moment. What is it 
that would uh, that would bring us peace victory triumph jesus is basically trying to show it's not swords it's not spears it's not armies and charioteers and guns and bombs you see that is why he weeps as he sees jerusalem on the horizon because he knows that this world only knows bloodshed that this world only understands violence and violence being the only way to bring victory but jesus has something else in his mind he weeps over jerusalem because he knows there is going to be violence and he knows violence only begets violence it only increases violence and it it's a vicious cycle that becomes more intense till everybody is consumed in that violence and that is why he weeps knowing what is going to happen to jerusalem even as it is completely ransacked and destroyed in ad 70 uh we once again reflect on those words what is it that would bring us peace the words of jesus you know the answer is actually found in a greek word and the greek word is called kinosis it's found in the book of philippians chapter 2 and i'll read a verse or two from this from this uh, epistle Philippians chapter 2 and in verse 5 the apostle Paul brings out something very interesting about Christ he says in verse 5 in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus have the same mindset as Christ Jesus in other words the mindset of this world and all of our mindset are so different from what Jesus has but notice what he goes on to say 6 verse 6 who being in the very nature god did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Verse 7, rather, he made himself nothing. Made himself nothing in the Greek, kenosis. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in, the, in human likeness. That word kenosis, made himself nothing, actually means emptied himself. He emptied himself. The Greek word kenosis means self-emptying. And for us who have now been exposed and have been continuing to learn Trinitarian theology, and I urge you all to learn more and more about that because it is so revolutionary in terms of what we understand of the God that we worship. Trinitarian theology we begin to see this word or this concept kenosis so powerfully being displayed in the trinitarian reality the uh, franciscan theologian bonaventure some of you may have heard of saint bonaventure uses the word to describe the trinity as a fountain of love now we know god is love but he uses this interesting phrase fountain of love which basically means the trinitarian reality father son holy spirit is constantly self-emptying themselves into each other the father empties himself into the son the son empties himself into the spirit the spirit in terms and empties himself into uh, the father there is this constant self-emptying taking place uh, which, of course, is the dynamic of the, you know, the Trinitarian, you know, reality. Uh, and you might wonder, well, I mean, if you empty yourself, uh, don't you become empty? No. That's the fountain of love. The more you empty yourself, the more you are filled. You see, uh, they are constantly pouring into each other. Uh, without the fear of 
becoming empty because the emptying is only refilling themselves because the fountain of love, as Bonaventure says, will never run dry. You remember Jesus saying, I will give you waters which will never thirst. I mean, which will never run dry. In other words, you'll never thirst again. You know, that is what kenosis means. There is no fear of withholding, no fear of emptying themselves completely because the fountain of love will never run dry. Right? And for all its weirdness, this, that is what, you know, we find it so hard to understand. This self-emptying of God, we think is weakness. But that is what Jesus is helping us and help, you know, trying to help us understand. That Jesus is establishing his kingdom, not through violence, but by self-emptying himself, by kenosis. Right? His victory over evil is through the process of self-emptying. You see, uh, as it says in Philippians chapter 2, though God, though Jesus is God, though Jesus is divine, he did not latch on, clutch his privilege as being, as being, for being divine and remain that way. No, he, what did he do? He humbled himself. We use the word humility so very often, don't we? He humbled himself. He set aside his divinity. He was self-emptying himself. And what, what did he do by self-emptying himself? He became a human, a weak human, a human just like you and me. And not only did he submit himself to humanity, to, to the flesh, but he also went on to become or to embrace death. I mean, can you imagine the self-emptying? Uh, a God, second person of the Trinity, he could call upon legions of angels. He could through the wave of his hand, destroy the entire cosmos because he brought the cosmos into existence. He could wave his hands and stars would form. And those stars would form galaxies. Those same hands submitted himself to the cross. That's self-empty. A powerful God who rules the universe, who sustains the universe, would self-empty himself to such an extent that he would even submit himself to the hatred and the evil of human beings, sinful human beings, to the point that he would actually die. Right? You see, Jesus has a different ethic. His victory is not through violence, but it is through kenosis, emptying himself, setting aside the privileges of divinity. And of course, we know he never resorted to any violence. And that's the reason why we may, we may have heard the kingdom of God is not of this world. It is not established in the way this world does by violence and killing and murder and cheating and grabbing and manipulation and intimidation, and we see that happening day in and day out in our country, in all the countries around the world. That's how they grab on to power. And Jesus is exactly the extreme opposite. He says, that's not the way to win a victory. The weirdness of Christianity, right? And that's why I reiterate those words of Jesus. If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. What he was saying is, I'm riding on a donkey. I don't have an army. I don't have swords and I don't have spears. But I am bringing peace. I am going to win a victory. A victory through self-emptying. You see, 
he bore the hatred of this world dying on a cross so that hatred could be dissolved spent defeated in god's love for his creation so jesus christ is either the greatest loser on the face of the earth or he is the greatest victor as we know from our perspective that indeed he has won the victory and we will celebrate that on resurrection sunday so you might wonder and you might ask me well how i mean are you uh, am i advocating pacifism in the way we understand it where we say oh you know we should not we should not challenge violence we should not be violent um right uh should we be a doormat and we should accept the violence that is perpetrated against us should we allow ourselves to be taken advantage of should we always submit to the evil perpetrated upon us are you saying we must be self emptying to the extent where we are constantly being put down is this what christianity is teaching us is this what this jesus is teaching us yes i must say also a no i'm confusing you a bit but uh, that's deliberate yes but i will there is also a no to it i'll come to it in a moment yes if you and i are treated unjustly if you and i are discriminated against if you and i are persecuted jesus wants us not to retaliate so to that extent it is a yes you see you and i do not use violence we don't use the same yardstick at the person who is evil doing evil to us because evil against evil doesn't work that's the teaching of jesus evil with evil doesn't work evil with evil only increases evil it gives it more power and it falls into a vicious circle till both are consumed evil doesn't ultimately win it feeds more evil so what do we do in the face of evil well the weirdness of the christian teaching jesus says be forgiving be compassionate be kind be self controlled return good for evil bless them if they curse you and if we believe in jesus if we claim him to be our lord and savior this is what he tells us blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven that is how the kingdom is established not through violence blessed are you when people insult you persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you and of course they killed jesus for that that's a yes but what is the no part of this the no part is i am not advocating deliberately choosing to suffer no i'm not saying we should invite persecution i'm not saying that we should allow ourselves to be used and abused i am not advocating sado masochism you know what is sado masochism hurting yourself and getting pleasure out of it <laughs> that's not what jesus is advocating right we don't self inflict injury to that extent it is a no and jesus himself says when you are persecuted in one place flee to another and thankfully he says before you are find places to flee things will change in other words he will return 
So, it's a hard teaching of Jesus. This reminds me of the night of January 22nd, 1999. The place was Manoharpur village in Orissa. A father with his two children. Tired after ministering to leprosy patients in the tribal belt of that particular area. Poor people. But he had gone there with his two children to minister to them. In the night after being tired, he was decided to sleep in a station wagon. A, a mob of violent men suddenly after midnight attacked station wagon, poured petrol on it, set fire to the car, deliberately prevented them from coming out so that they would burn to death. You might know his name. The name is Graham Stuart Staines. His two sons, Philip and Timothy, they were age nine and seven. After the convictions took place, in an interview, his wife, Gladys Staines, made the weird choice, I use the word weird deliberately, of forgiving the perpetrators. And this is what she said. In forgiveness, there is no bitterness. And when there is uh, no bitterness, there is hope. This consolation comes from Jesus Christ. What was she doing? She was emptying herself. She was practicing what Jesus did, kenosis. She was emptying herself of hatred. She was emptying herself of the desire for revenge. She was emptying herself of hostility and enmity. She chose rather to forgive. As our Lord did. The weirdness of Christianity. And this is where I come to Romans chapter 8. The second reading today. You know in Romans chapter 8. We are spoken of being as more than conquerors. And when we hear the word conqueror. Can you imagine what comes to your mind? violence, bloodshed, right? But notice what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8 and verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written? For your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, verse 37 says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And the question is, why are we more than conquerors? We are not conquerors because we might have 16-inch uh, biceps. You know, We are not conquerors because we can throw karate chops or fist punches faster than anybody else. We are not Conquerors because we can overpower somebody else like a bouncer does with his bulging muscles. We are not conquerors because we use the sword or violence or intimidation. But we are conquerors because we can face hardship. We can face persecution without harboring hatred. We are more than conquerors because... We can face dangers without retaliating. We are more than conquerors because we can face injustice without revenge. We can face hurt without getting even. And going the distance and actually forgiving. In forgiveness, as Gladys Stein said, there is no bitterness and where there is no bitterness, there is hope. The consolation comes from Jesus Christ. Brethren, as we usher in the Holy Week, as we look forward to the various 
meetings and thoughts that we will have during the Holy Week. Let our Lord's words keep ringing in our ears. What would bring peace? Let us not forget that we are more than conquerors, not because we can resort to violence, but because we manifest the fruit of the Holy Spirit in the face of evil. We respond by love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All of these foolishness to the Greeks. A stumbling block for the Jews. Weirdness for this modern world. But the words of eternal life for us who believe in Jesus Christ. God bless you.